Okay. Can you hear it? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so that was my video. I hope everyone liked it. Um, okay, so when thinking through the concept of place, uh, I wanted to start at the root of where I felt most connected to myself and my family and my culture. So I started filming what was around me and what caught my interest. Um, I wanted to focus on like life, living, breathing entities that make up our natural world and also the land that uh, holds so many like untold stories. Um, so I wrote the poem after I had arranged all the footage, watching the ways in which the elements interact with one another, as well as living creatures. Uh, I kind of just wrote what came out, what I felt, what I saw and what it meant to me. Um, so the idea of place can exist as a metaphorical space, a physical space, or even emotional. I felt that I tapped into all three concepts through the process of making this video. Um, so place in relation to home is thinking through the experiences of my ancestors, connecting with the land on which I grew up on, and connecting with my family who I rarely see. Uh, so that was my thoughts behind thinking of place and what it meant to me and working as an artist research and um, being a part of the Making with Place project. Uh, Arts-based research practices are important because they break down academic barriers that have been imposed upon us by colonialism. Uh, it's a chance for us to better understand one another, to see ourselves in one another, and to love each other unconditionally. I feel that arts-based research is an accessible tool for us to communicate with one another, especially for those who didn't necessarily attend a post-secondary institution. 
Um, I feel that the process of making is just as important as what is produced in the end because uh, what is discovered along the way, I feel is just as valuable as like the final outcome of the project. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my experience with making and creating and thinking through place. Nice. Thanks, Bert. Um, hi, folks. I'm Phyllis. Um, I use she, her, or they pronouns. And um, so Charlotte had asked us to share a little bit about what we created and uh, how place factors in, as you've heard from Bert, and then sort of art research or arts as research, or in my view, art practice as research. Um, so I'll just show you a little bit about my own Practice. So for this project, I explored working with natural dyes. And you can see that um, the one that I was most obsessed with is indigo, which really is um, a really old and beautiful form that, of course, uh, from which the fascination with blue has sprung up. And um, uh, certainly the way uh, it's also been referred to as slavery's second cash crop because it was um, brought then from India and Japan. It was brought um, uh, to the Central and South Americas. And then of course was um, part of enslaving um, black persons um, brought over to cultivate the fields, of course, for, uh, for profit and capitalism. <laughs> and uh, evolved very much, of course, into the synthetic versions that we enjoy now when we wear our blue jeans. Um, so for me, exploring with indigo um, was multi-layered. Um, a lot of it because I was, in, I was introduced to indigo by uh, Lisa Myers, who actually was with the um, Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. And we worked together in a studio practice, kind of exploring what comes up in studio practice working with natural dyes. And so indigo became a real fascination for me in that sense, in terms of how you work with it, but also because of its history and my interaction with it as a white um, person of settler colonial privilege. All these dynamics were at work um, with this practice. Oops. Oops, hang on, I'm trying to change that slide. So I started to um, create the vats and uh, in my, uh, off my back porch basically. And, um, and then I, and I kind of obsessively worked every weekend actually on, on uh, creating vats and folding and patterning and working with resistance and combining rust and um, and uh, uh, really exploring what happened depending on how tightly I wound the work or how um, loosely I wound it. And I was just so amazed with the generosity of the dye that came from the plants, which you if, if you really want to know more about indigo, it's pretty fascinating. And that, of course, is a key component to doing any kind of artistic practice research is that you need to know your materials and really get to know them along the way. So I, I found just the study of indigo itself to be so fascinating, but also the study of all these other um, materials and all the ways, um, the processes that I used as I, as I did the work. So even the areas of resistance, I learned a lot about that in terms of how um, how tightly I wound the wax string that I used or the elastics or uh, the blocks, or as you can see here, when I introduced metal agents. Um, so there's so there's so much that was kind of coming back to me through this uh, sort of artistic dialogue um, uh, with material. I'm sorry, because I'm sharing the screen, I cannot read my notes. So I'm doing this all from my mind, from my memory. I'll do what I can. <laughs> so throughout the whole thing, and I shared this a lot with the other researchers, is that I became sort of obsessed with patterns. And because it was the summer that it was, uh, in terms of just like the amplification of the violence of white supremacy and racism in our systems and our structures, 
um, I started to really, I think, obsess with patterns um, and their kind of fractal layering and kind of uh, using, I used that to be able to work through concepts of whiteness and the imprinting and the fractal layering of whiteness that I believe is so prominent in all of our systems and that I also operate from and have internalized and been socialized with. So um, I was really grateful to be able to bring this stuff to the group because I think it was a real uh, way in our artistic practice that we were really able to kind of explore some of the themes that would be surfaced. And, um, and it also meant that even though I was in a coordination role on this project, I was able to, I think kind of, um, well, it felt really vulnerable to share my artistic practice with folks, um, but I think also the art practice and the art exploration and the themes that came up, that's really, was sort of an equalizing factor, I suppose, in terms of um, just our, our roles in terms of artwork. But it also, I think, um, supported the notion though that we can't really erase our positionalities when we're working together in um, qualitative research or any arts-based research, but it's important to be able to, I think, be transparent about with them and deal with them um, as a group together. So the power dynamic um, created, I think, with Charlotte and I sort of as, as coordinating leads in the project with the group was something that really um, we had to kind of work with throughout. And I'm, I'm sure that we'll get into talking about that a little bit, but I think that was a really important and alive piece, certainly for me. And I've really been guided a lot by some writing by Stephanie Earlbacker Fox, who writes about coexistence to equal co-resistance. So I can write that in the chat later, but I really have appreciated a lot of her articles, um, particularly for uh, non-Indigenous or non-racialized um, researchers uh, to really kind of um, understand or come to um, arts practice research work with a new mind. Uh, yes, and we know that that's like an unrelenting kind of process and practice, you know, that you can't get away from. Okay, so exploring things uh, and the idea of fractals um, and particularly with respect to whiteness, I started to explore what would happen if you had tightly patterned work that you would gradually stretch out over time and with the dyes, um, what would happen if you allowed a fixed pattern to kind of be pulled out. So this is an artistic process obviously that I was using to understand if there could be any way that these um, patterning, that the patterning of whiteness could somehow be manipulated, could somehow find some space and some breathing room, particularly during this time in order to make way for systems change and, um, uh, and really for um, uh, an address, an address to violence, a response to the violence of whiteness. So I found this really fascinating for myself and I created these kind of cloth texts um, about that process, about pulling out patterns. And that for me as an artist was really fascinating as an artist researcher was also fascinating and I'm wanting to do more work in that regard. After I did that, I felt um, immediately, I don't know, sort of more inspired uh, to pursue than new form. And um, so I started working with other plants like marigold. You can see sort of some of the marigold powder here in the corner. You can see the bottom uh, right corner. You can see some of the ways you work with resistance in terms of wrapping and tying. And I was really fortunate to work by the water side and, um, and where there was lots of rocks. And so it was really um, exciting to kind of position the art practice and the research practice in that setting, working with the natural world. Here you can see, I'm just trying to illustrate again how incredible these dyes are. This is the sequoia tree, big old tree that produces these amazing um, 
cones that produce these seeds and the seeds get ground down and produce a byproduct that creates this amazing color that you see in the center, sort of richy brown purple. It's just so gorgeous. And um, it just fascinates me so much that these trees um, speak in this way through color. And so I started to explore um, what would happen if I washed things out just in the waters themselves. And that was really exciting. And I played again with these kinds of folds to uh, reveal these rich patterns and really what seemed like rich stories. Further, I kept going with this idea of exploring and collaborating with um, nature around me. So I was positioning some of my dye work against um, the water and against the stones, which was really fun to do and felt like in a really alive um, collaborative process. And this is just, again, some more of those amplifications. When it came to our production experiments then in September, Bert showed you their work, um, uh, uh, the, the video piece, which we actually projected then onto a large metal wall at the Bentway, which for me was this really powerful act of remapping that space and of really kind of changing the understanding of that space and how even just a video capture of um, Bert's exploration um, up north in your own uh, territories really translated in that totally industrial and metal space. And so there's something again here I feel that we found in terms of the power of artistic production and how it can actually translate to take up space. A couple more shots of this elemental unlearning lab because really that's essentially what my work ended up being like. Making with Place is a project that really was working at the intersections of place, art, and activism. And um, so in my view, we were, we were really contending with a lot of things that it's just impossible to kind of talk about in a quick 10 to 15 minute presentation. But um, the main piece for me is that art itself engaging with place and elements of place all the different kinds of components of what place is um, can elicit some uh, kind of um, themes that we can attach to uh, that would shift and prompt social change. That's what we were really trying to go for. So through our exploration, our weekly Zoom sessions, sort of like yours, where we came together and we chatted and through the work that we exposed to each other, place was really revealed as so many things, land beneath your feet, sacred, flora and fauna around you, complex, uh, subjective, contextual, situational, um, historic and current impacts of colonialism and racism were actually, they had to be contended with throughout. That's just a reality of making art and making with this place in which we live. The internal landscape of place, how we have, um, you know, sort of uh, internalized many components of that, but also how we, um, where we're from, our own stories, you know, and um, imagination as well, obviously. Place is also dynamic, changing, and transcendent. So you can see here with Jamal Nugent, who is uh, a, a photographer and a video maker, and also one of the researchers on the project. Again, this is more powerful than these words that I just said to you a moment ago. You know, he's mapped different places that we were in, the context of the pandemic, the context of folks. I love this, like basically tenting right there on the sidewalk, some, you know, in the financial district. And of course, how important it was to center our experiences with nature. These were our crazy code trees and our uh, mind maps. Um, this for me was always a really interesting tension, Charlotte, and I would go back and forth because, and I remember actually Bert saying, you know, what, you know, when we were talking about creating code trees, which is sort of a natural part, obviously, of um, research practice or social science research practice, um, Bert's saying, well, 
didn't, isn't the work we're creating, aren't we doing that with creating our work? And this is exactly the, the dialogue that we always went back and forth with is just the idea that the work itself is, um, is the code. Uh, and it's very challenging to talk about that because of course, I think um, we're still wrestling with this idea that research creation or artistic practice is a research that's not necessarily objective. It's subjective. And that's actually, to me, what makes it really powerful, but that's also what makes it really confusing in the research world or in the academic research world. Nevertheless, arts practice revealed relationship with self, land, community, with time and space, um, uh, revealed itself um, as a knowledge-making um, uh, modality. And as we worked through it, we did actually encounter some uh, things that we would call activisms or intentions and desires for community and culture. Okay, I don't want to read that right now. It's too big. Here we go. Look at this. This is another researcher, Beerus, um, uh, who was creating, I think, was sort of remapping space with performance production. And so this was actually like a video that he was shooting at Young and Dundas Square. And again, right there, he um, kind of powerfully, I would say, glyphed the space. And glyphing is something that's talked about by Karen Recolette, um, who uh, actually has uh, done a lot of work researching um, the glyphing power of um, uh, Anishinaabe round dance that happens at various intersections. And um, so it's also really powerful to read some work by Raren Karen Recolette. Um, on the left here, you see this sweet uh, gift um, of uh, Medicine Mobile here. Um, Olympia Tripus, another artist with the project, created a seven, another uh, large mobile of 17 dream catchers that she gifted to um, an encampment in the West End of Toronto. And then this is another example of a gift mobile that sits again under this looming industrial structure of the Gardner Expressway. So again, a remapping of place in temporary form through performance um, or in a longer term form through uh, some public art installation um, that is sort of iterative in nature. Right, here's that old code tree. Here's what the code tree, oh yes, I was sorry, I also wanted to mention this. This is pre Rahal, another um, uh, uh, another artist, a researcher in the project who then actually did a lot of uh, different kind of place activism, I would say, in terms of doing a lot of online um, work uh, throughout the project and created the zine called Crip Collab, the second um, version, which just came out recently, particularly highlighting and amplifying the great work of artists with disabilities. And this is another example, Jess DeWitt, a researcher on the project, and Susie Mensa, who collaborated with Jess to further iterate this um, mural that is in Toronto's West End at Queen Annabelle called the Drake Rock. And this is a really powerful um, uh, collaboration and just a really great way to take up space in an area in Queen West, which you know is um, quickly becoming quite gentrified. So these were, uh, I hope you don't mind that, that I, I'm sorry, it's seeming like a big long lecture, but I just wanna be able to highlight sort of the, the things of the project that came. So the, the, um, uh, the, the project's activisms really were suggesting that we need to be involved in art making that pertains to our lives in the world. We need to take advantage of um, the storytelling um, through public art with declarations of injustice through public art. Um, the project really unearthed how important it was to be involved in mutual growth and to practice a new ethic of solidarity, not charity in the works of Dean Spade um, in terms of community, anti-individualism in favor of ooh, uh, collective care, and accountability and responsibility of systems and institutions to um, really deal with oppressive language and practice. This was like a really critical learning, of course, for us with words spoken back to sketch 
words that we can take back to um, academic institutions just in terms of the damage and the impacts of oppressive languages to communities on the margins in particular. Collaborative research. So we really discovered that we feel the most powerful work can come from collaborative research with communities to create change. And of course, underlying everything is sort of a, um, a really a constantly renewing and intentional practice of regenerative reciprocity when it comes to sustainability and relationships with the earth. So these were pretty powerful intentions for community that I think the project revealed and we're still actually just learning to talk actually about the findings of the project. So these are just some of them, but I feel, um, I think they're pretty brilliant and they pretty, and they really uh, ring true with so many important um, social activist um, projects that are happening now and that are needed for our time. For me, this project again pointed out that young people are leaders of culture. They have critical knowledge uh, and um, that can surface through art practice and production and that they can make change in society. This is you know, kind of a no brainer, but I really feel it's important to keep reiterating that. Also that an artistic practice that involves place is a real connector of self with the natural world, self with community, and self with um, desires for justice. Um, the collaboration was one of the biggest things about the project as well. We really learned to understand each other. We worked with a lot of curiosity about each other's practice and um, that came first. And this constant commitment to work through power dynamics. Okay, I feel like I feel like that's that. That's what I can say right now. And that's already probably too much. And I'd love to hear from you and have questions and we can talk more about it. I'm gonna stop sharing here. So yeah, there was a lot there. Uh, anybody have any questions? Thanks so much, Phyllis and Bert. That was excellent. And I really love the way you really really tapped into the materiality of your work and the form of how we how everything was being expressed. Um, yeah, I'd really like you to open the uh, the floor to the class right now. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start um, by just kind of putting things back out to you, Bert, um, uh, after Phyllis's reflections in particular in relation to that ongoing dimension of negotiation regarding sort of position. Um, I remember in, when we prepared for this this talk, uh, you had some interesting stuff to to talk about that. So yeah, um, maybe I'll just put that question out to you right now. Um, yeah, I think being on the other side of the project, uh, being like a hired research artist, um, there definitely was like those dynamics of like Phyllis and Charlotte, like it's, they're the ones in power of the project, they're the ones hiring us. Um, we're being hired to create this, like, we're being hired to basically create an art piece and be involved in, like, weekly talks uh, around the idea of place and, like, the concept of place, but it was, it was, it was, like, a really open experience, and I felt like even though those dynamics were, like, obviously there, it didn't feel like we were, I don't know, like I was disrespected in any way or like my voice wasn't heard when um, we would talk about things. And I feel like it was like a very open and safe space for people. Yeah, that's what I felt anyway. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about the process oriented question that you brought up when you were, when you were talking about how um, the, the, the things you learn along the way are as important in some ways or, or they, they take on a special kind of importance and, and there's an outcome of the art project but there's also the experience of making and, and something I, I, I thought was so amazing was the way that uh, especially during this time of being in COVID and being in isolation and, and the activisms and, and the resistances uh, that Phyllis spoke to that were so important both to the time that we're living and also to the expressions that were coming out of people sharing and making. Um, there really seemed to be um, that solidarity piece be between folks and there seemed to be um, uh, a real witnessing 
I think, of 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 one another in the work. Um, do, uh, yeah, I, I, I um, so yeah, I, that's. A, a, I, I don't know if other of you have anything to say about that, but that but that idea of witnessing and the process of that, and the way that people um, express that in different ways through the art and through the discussions was was really powerful for me. Yeah, I think when it comes to the process of like um, art space research process to me is like a really big part of that because it's about like experimenting trying new things um like you you go into something maybe thinking you already like know what you're doing but I feel like you continuously learn along the way and sometimes like your project shifts from something that you didn't really think it was going to be in the beginning that you just started off with an idea um but yeah, I, I think arts-based research is really important for people because it definitely allows people to connect with one another um, who I guess aren't necessarily like, like academic and like not really like an academic based way. So like the borders of academia kind of like don't matter as much especially when it comes to like research like thinking about me and like my community and my family um i feel like there's so many knowledge keepers there that hold research where i'm from who i don't think would necessarily fit into this mold of like i don't know the colonial institution of like how we obtain research so yeah, working like collaboratively was pretty awesome. I think because we all came, like it was a very like diverse group of people. We were all going through like different things throughout like the pandemic. And I don't know, there were so many things going on. So it was just, I felt like a big part of me, like a big part of the research through the project was talking with everyone and talking with artists and hearing what people were going through. and where they were coming from and like and like hearing their stories and their experiences it, it kind of does like shift the way that you think about the world and like um I don't know it like makes you realize like a lot about yourself as well yeah like maybe some internalized feelings that you had that you didn't quite understand before those can really be like broken down through conversations with community and people so I think it's really important to connect with one another yeah. <laughs> throughout the project that's good I just will add to that that I think that the group really worked together to listen to each other so when you speak about witnessing too I think a lot of that happens through um uh talking and through the kind of environment that we set up for each other but also I think it was great to be able to have our work be the first thing, the first way that we could speak ourselves into the room kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it, that all also made it um, just more accessible somehow and we could relate to each other through the images or through the reasons we were creating and um, through kind of just um, what our intentions were in creating the work and what we were discovering. Um, so I think, again, that's why it was so, that's another reason that I think it was just so powerful in terms of um, really reinforcing through arts-based research or through arts practice that we actually all had something really critical that we could share. Everybody had something that they could add to this particular moment in time and what we were trying to get at in terms of what we want for community and culture. So, yeah. yeah, and I feel like that really showed in everyone's work too, because although we were like researching the same thing, like it was every like piece that people made, it came out so differently. And like the idea of place, like it could mean so much to like so many different people. So yeah, I think it just like really opened my mind a lot too with like yeah. how I thought about place and even like how I went about, um, I don't know, what I learned through like process and conversation as well. Thank you. That's, this is, uh, it, this is, 
really for me um, a nice dialogue on the richness of knowledge and 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 how creative practice speaks on multiple levels and I think that that's something that we want to explore with qualitative research and we've definitely had it's interesting when you were talking about code trace Phyllis we've definitely had people in previous sessions of this class feel uncomfortable with the with with the the way that we talk about subjectivity we talk about multiple plural ways of knowing and knowledge as as as, as many different things and that there is no one truth and then we start pulling things apart and putting them in little boxes and code trees and it feels a little bit feels like tension and, and I think that that's something we feel in arts-based research as well because you know naming uh, artistic process starts to starts to almost kind of like try to confine and it's not something that wants to be confined but I think that's also a really important space for us to live in um, similar to the other spaces that you've both brought up or you're bringing that up in the in this dialogue and I really appreciate that um I just want to say to there's a question in the chat uh -huh, great uh, when you're planning an arts based project does the intended social impact inform the process or is the social impact revealed through the process fascinating mm -hmm. me both mm -hmm. um, I think that's why it's such an alive modality of research and inquiry um, because it's not following a linear stream I know that that can make it frustrating as well but I think it kind of, it builds on itself. So you might come with some kind of opposed question, which we did um, definitely based on the experience that we have both had working with young people um, who would identify as kind of navigating uh, various forms of oppressions and marginalizations. We definitely have seen the power of the arts to um, not just in terms of the impact on their own lives, but also what they speak through their work that can affect um, broader society and that to me the social impact was less about what happens when young people on the margins make art together it was less about that and it was more about if we actually had the arts to be able to look at what the um, knowledge is that gets pointed to and how place actually works through young people um, and works through art practice you know um uh, what is the knowledge that would be revealed there that would be helpful for social change in community. And so I guess it was kind of like at the start and it got iterated uh, throughout the process and then it also showed up at the end again. So a bit of a circular kind of thing. You gotta be willing to work in circles. <laughs> oh, there's another question too. Should I just throw in with this question? Okay, there's a question. I'm interested in how it felt to work with natural materials that wear off on you. I'm thinking about the staining of the dyes and how the work and the dye wore off on people. Or I suppose it was a nice reminder. Nice. Love that question. Um, yeah, there were times when I couldn't get rid of the stains at all on my hands and my fingers or the smell, particularly of indigo, which had this kind of... Um, mnemonic memory trigger for me because it smells very much like the blonde hair bleach that my mom used to always use when I was a kid. Um, so working with it definitely had uh, that kind of stimulation. And then also working with sumac and sequoia and, and, and working with marigold was very earthy and medicinal and very deep. And so it had also a kind of, um, reaction with me. Um, everybody that I brought the dyes to always said, can we please work with this? We want to learn how to do this. So even the color itself and the patterns itself, I think really excited people. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we really couldn't do um, dye practice work together. So I'm definitely going to try to do that in a, in a next project. But I don't know if, um, if even just seeing the um, uh, if even just seeing the dye work, if there's something Bert you wanted to add to about that. Oh, I love your dye work. I still have the little, the little like pieces of cotton that you gave yeah. everyone. Oh, right on, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. I really want to do it too. <laughs> as, as yeah. <laughs> um, great question here of why are arts-based project great tools for social change? Um, well, for a lot of the things that we're saying. Um, I do believe that, again, 
uh, because the arts do surface conversations of difference um, and are not necessarily trying to search for sameness or homogeneity, but they really allow everybody to have their own story. And to me, the necessary components of social change are absolutely to allow us to have our distinctiveness and our individuation while still trying to figure out how we work those stories together to make change because the social change that we need is to get to break out of this one homogenized way that we've been viewed um, and when we had differing perspectives to me that's where we're going to actually get at the kinds of communities that we want to live in Bert, I don't know if you have anything to say about that stuff. Um, well, this question makes me reflect on uh, like the collective that I'm a part of, which is like an indigenous collective. And we basically, um, well, pre-pandemic, we were hosting um, like cultural making arts-based workshops together. So when I think about um, arts-based projects being a great tool for social change, I definitely think that by like bringing people together um, on a project, it, yeah, like it creates a dialogue, it creates like a space for people to go. And it definitely, um, I think it allows, well, the way that my collective did anyway, I think it allowed people to connect with like their culture in ways that they, that wasn't accessible to them before. So I guess it definitely allows like an accessibility and like a space for people to like converse with one another. Um, yeah, and just like learn from each other, which I think is like, I don't know, the, the best thing, just having conversation. To me, you can learn so much from that, like by actually like connecting with people in community instead of like reading about like a culture in a book why don't you actually like talk to people from that community and you know like make your yeah <laughs> i am rambling but yeah our great answers thank you so much Anybody got anything else? Some nice reflections here in the chat um, of people bringing forth their own experiences they're coming out from the work, which I'm sure is happening on lots of levels and I think really speaks yes. to what you were both talking about, about the, the different ways that we that we enter into um, um, when we see this kind of work and, and it's, it's more full. It's more. It's more fully how we experience the world, isn't it? Than the, than some of the other ways that we kind of compartmentalize and research, which for me is is so effective, and so um, emotive. Um, mm. Yeah, I wanted to say that um, Charlotte created some really cool work. Also, <laughs> um, uh, I'll show you my screen really quick. Ah. Sure. Yeah, it's gonna happen. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> oops, sorry. It's so uh, my. As you can see, my crazy screen. Charlotte, I don't know if you want to speak to your lament. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I created a, a a a vocal piece that that turned into a bit of a sound art piece. Something that I'm I'm really just learning about. Um, in terms of how to make art with sound or what sound art might look like or feel like uh, and sound like really more than anything. Um, but uh, I was, uh, I was um, working with uh, vocalizing with birds um, in an area of Toronto called the, um, the Tommy Thompson Park uh, down on the Leslie Street Spit. Folks in the, who know the East End might have been down there. It's an urban industrial park and there's a, a large migratory bird colonies that have uh, taken up home and space and place there. And uh, they're very interesting birds, these cormor cormorant birds, and they make a very, uh, what to me is a very effective, uh, you know, emotive kind of sound. Uh, and it sounded to me like a lament, like, a, like, a, like an expression of grief that I've heard um, in various different cultures that use vocalizations of grief to, to manage and move through grieving processes and express them. Um, and so I went down there and I did some recording of the birds 
and uh, I, I, I vocalized my own, my own sort of sounds with the bird sounds and riffing off of the birds, kind of, um, kind of improvising with the birds and, uh, and created the, this, uh, this sound piece. And, and it was a cycle that uh, the, the, the team, when they were giving me feedback, told me that they saw it happening as kind of like a round, which is sometimes you hear songs that repeat themselves and they have like a, a, a circular kind of notion to them as a cycle. Um, so I worked to create a, a, a piece with a friend of mine who put some guitar to it. Uh, but it was it was capturing for me the time that we were talking about and the, and the, the various different expressions of grief that were coming up. A lot of our artists, researchers were very powerful activists and they were expressing the the griefing and the action that was coming out of that grieving around the calls around white supremacy that we were seeing, and and uh, and also the the sadness that we were seeing, and and in the and the you know the violences and the deaths that were happening, and 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 the isolation that folks were seeing, and the and the pandemic and the and the vulnerability that uh, people, everyone was feeling, but that uh, you know uh, definitely there was more vulnerability in certain spaces and places than others. So so it was a way of kind of expressing and bringing together those different things. What I loved was when Charlotte showed her projection at the gardener um, or underneath the gardener again at the Bentway. It was actually in a staircase, but because of the way the light was at night, it looks like it's just this open window going right into the sky. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, even just this idea of, of, win of grief creating this kind of window, you know, in uh, or the sound actually creating this kind of... Um, window of space in the midst of all of this um, grief that we were experiencing. I don't know, I just thought it really was a powerful projection again in kind of remapping space and can show you again just how much power there is to articulate through the arts, even just in a moment. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, I learned a lot about vulnerability and I'm still not um, feeling all that confident with these kind of expressions, but so I didn't post it on the, on the e-class, but I will now because Phyllis has now engaged I'm me sorry. to do so. No, that's good. Thank you. I appreciate it. I need that. Um, so I'll post it for the class as well. But that was um, a good lesson. I should have asked for permission first. No, no, it's great. Ethics, I think sometimes ethics. you need, sometimes you need, uh, especially, and I think that's part of, um, part of what I think I find very powerful about this kind of work is the the safe space to take risks um you know like a, a a place that's created that has that holds you and then you can do these things like something like that which for me was was felt very um well it just felt like a, a it felt risky because i i don't feel confident in those kind of expressions but I'm, I'm i'm feeling like i'm getting there from from this group and that's also as an individual internal landscape a place of learning um we have three minutes left um, I don't know if that's time for this group activity that you had a plan for, Phyllis. Probably not. No, <laughs> mm. no problem. Um, so, so yeah. Any other thoughts or questions that are coming up? I really appreciate that there's um, folks also who are who are expressing their own arts practices and memories and, and emotions that are coming out of what's being discussed. And I think that's uh, that's a, a learning for our group as well. Um, but yes, please. Uh, other questions? You were sharing the challenges of doing this work. Did making with place any, any face any challenges? Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you, uh, do you either one of you want to take that one on as a, as a wrap up? <laughs> I think just the transparency with um, like creating a safe space for people where they felt comfortable in like sharing their experiences so yeah having, having the transparency was like really important along the project with working with the project uh, because we were all coming from such different places and we didn't like we knew I don't know I didn't know everyone going into the project so we were meeting weekly on zoom and it was kind of like like you wanted to be able to say what you had to say but um, even when we disagreed on things, there was still like facilitated conversation around it um, that felt, I don't know, like it felt like no one was trying to like argue with each other, even if we did disagree, like we had conversations about that. So the transparency aspect was really important and like feeling comfortable 
I know even with Phyllis and Char Charlotte, they shared like their whole budget report with us and like shared like their whole grant proposal with us. And they even um, changed the language in which they were talking about um, marginalized youth because like there were some people in the in the project who didn't think like the majority of us didn't think that like that language was appropriate to be used to like describe what was going on um so yeah it was it was a lot of work with communication but yeah i'll just add quickly that the um the at the end too we had a couple really great days of debrief where we surface that we didn't all feel comfortable going into different areas, particularly the the um, installation of the medicine mobiles, the dream catcher mobiles in the encampment. And this was a that actually was a really powerful conversation about sort of ethics as an art maker, particularly, um, you know, ethics that are about building relationships and not just going into a place to put work just for the sake of doing that, but that there's a responsibility to the community around you. There's also a responsibility to, to know what you know and also realize what you don't know mm. and uh, community with which you are connected or with which you are not connected. And, um, and so to kind of def definitely to test those comfort zones, but with respect with people um, and also don't miss the opportunity to explore, um, you know, kind of the interaction that doing work together or putting work out in the public realm could, um, could offer you. Yeah, because I think sometimes, at least when it came to the encampment, I wasn't really part of that because I mean, it was COVID and I didn't feel like, like that safe being in that space. Um, but I also felt like, I don't know, like hearing the conversations about, well, it was Olympia's project. So hearing the conversations about Olympia and she knew she knew some of the people who were staying at the encampment. She had a personal relationship with them. Um, and I, I don't know, it kind of like broke down like some barriers for me that I had maybe put up around myself before where if you don't like really understand something, you know, you kind of like stay away from it a bit, but hearing like, I don't know, like, yeah, you didn't also didn't want to like go into a community if you couldn't actually, um, I don't know, provide some sort of like lasting relationship with them either. Cause you don't want to just infiltrate a community and then leave. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a lot of like good conversations around that, but yeah. I think we were able to understand one another better after that. Amazing. Thank you. I, we could talk about this probably for another two hours, but uh, we are at time. Um, and uh, I do really appreciate both of you being here today. And, and it, it fills me with a, a real joy to, uh, to continue to talk to, with you on this. And, and I really appreciate everyone um, listening and asking good questions. And uh, please keep, uh, keep abreast of our project. We will be posting um, materials and things at makingwithplace.ca. It's not, it's not live yet, but, uh, but we, will be, uh, we will be bringing all of this forward into the world further. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just deep thanks to you, Bert and Phyllis. Uh, that was a really wonderful illustration. And I think a, 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 a great way of coming to the end of the term and a lot of, it brought up a lot of uh, really, uh, really key things that we've been reflecting on and, and some really important, some important ideas to get out there. Um, and I just want to also reiterate to the class, taking this maybe as another inspiration that la next week is our last class. And if you'd like to contribute any creative materials, to our last class, whether it's a photo or a poem or something expressing what you've learned from your research projects, both your interviews or your final assignment, um, we're gonna do a little bit of creative share session. So thank you for the inspiration to lead us into our last class. And I wish everybody a really wonderful week and, or week, we are just starting the week. Yes, wonderful week. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Goodbye. Take care.